This is a production of Cornell University. All right, well, good morning. Uh, it's great to be back uh, again after almost a year away. Uh, this morning, uh, I'll be sharing some of the highlights of the work uh, that I've done as a PhD student over the last six years. Uh, these are, I'll be covering three different projects that uh, are fairly unrelated. Uh, the first two in a little more depth than the last one, just very briefly. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about the progress that we've done to uh, develop cucumbers with resistance to downy mildew which is the uh, most widespread and devastating disease on cucumbers uh, in the US and around the world. Uh, then I'll be sharing some of the work we've, been, we've done to uh, map the major powdery mildew resistance, locusts and squash, which is one of the most widely used genes uh, in squash breeding, but uh, which to date uh, didn't have any markers available for it. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'll briefly talk about a collaborative effort we've been doing with the USDA uh, to develop some genomic resources for uh, an important USDA uh, pea core collection that's used by uh, pea breeders not only uh, in North America but around the world. So uh, first off I'll talk about uh, the work we've done in cucumbers. Uh, I was really got involved in this project from day one uh, and this project was started uh, in response to an urgent need from the cucumber industry uh, to solve a new disease crisis. And I say new not because downy mildew was new in cucumbers because uh, it had been around since the 1800s, but uh, for many decades, growers had never really had to worry about downy mildew at all. Uh, and that's in large part thanks to the efforts of breeders here at Cornell and um, Wisconsin and Clemson and some other places at really developing uh, robust disease resistance packages in cucumber, uh, including to downy mildew. Well, that all came crashing down uh, right around 2006, uh, and you can see from this headline in the American Vegetable Grower magazine, an old enemy reemerges. Uh, suddenly, growers were seeing what to many of them was almost a, a new disease. Uh, many were not uh, really sure what it was, um, but it came in a very quick and dramatic fashion. Uh, so here you can see some of the symptoms of downy mildew on cucumbers. Uh, downy mildew, uh, You'll often see downy mildew first uh, characterized by very angular chlorotic lesions. It's a foliar disease, so uh, you see it on the leaves. And, and those uh, chlorotic areas eventually coalesce and turn necrotic until you have total plant death. And the time that you first see a chlorotic lesion on one leaf of a plant to the time it's completely dead and crispy uh, can be as little as three weeks without any sort of intervention. So, uh, it happens uh, really, really, really quickly. And uh, in 2006 alone, uh, it, it was just caused devastating production losses. Individual states were reporting losses in tens of millions of dollars. And uh, you know that's a pretty big deal considering the total production value uh, in the US is around $350 million. So uh, another reason this was uh, such uh, a, a bad disease was that uh, downy mildew was present, it is, is aerially dispersed uh, by asexual zoospores, it's an oomycete, and uh, it can travel for hundreds of miles. So uh, in the time, in a three week span that your plant is dying, uh, the pathogen can uh, reproduce from an initial spore landing to, to producing millions of spores in 10 days. Those can travel to nearby plants, nearby farms, and uh, if the wind is right, hundreds or even thousands of miles away in some cases. And it's not a pathogen that overwinters uh, in cold places, but it will overwinter in uh, southern Florida where they don't have a frost. And it marches up the coast uh, as spring temperatures get warmer, uh, which also happens to coincide when people are planting their cucumbers. And uh, Ninety percent of cucumber production is in eastern states, in kind of this area where you see um, the downy mildew. And, and to give you an idea, all of these green and blue spots are uh, areas that at one time or another throughout the season uh, reported downy mildew. And these are just the areas where it's reported. Uh, pretty much you can fill in that whole map in the eastern U.S. of where the disease actually was. But um, for... Uh, 90% of production in eastern states, uh, pickling cucumbers, Michigan is a big place, uh, and Florida, North Carolina, Wisconsin are important, and for slicers, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. So these places get downy mildew extremely early in the season. Uh, in, the, in the North Atlantic area, in the Great Lakes region, 
uh, where we are, uh, we also have a one-two punch, not only from disease coming up from the south, but also from greenhouses and hothouses that have cucumber production all year round. So there's really no escaping this disease. If you grow cucumbers, you will have downy mildew on your cucumbers. So not surprisingly, uh, in 2008, there was a survey uh, from basically, for ev basically everybody involved in the cucumber industry, and one of the questions was, what can public research institutions do? And not surprisingly, uh, downy mildew research was ranked number one priority. Um, we need to find fungicides, we need to develop resistance, we need to develop forecasting protocols, anything related to downy mildew. So in response to that, uh, we started a breeding program. Uh, the first thing we had to figure out was, is there any sort of acceptable resistance out there right now? So, uh, and, and this was the year before I joined, so I can't take credit for this, but um, Michael and company started this uh, effort with uh, looking at USDA accessions, looking at heirlooms, uh, going back into the Cornell seed vaults, pulling out old lines that at one time uh, were reported to have downy mildew resistance, and just growing really as many things as we could uh, with as many tips and as much data as we could um, uh, dig up. And what we found was that there were no cultivars that had uh, what would even approach acceptable levels of resistance. But we did find a few um, old varieties, heirlooms, and some of the lines that had been developed at Cornell in the past that had um, more resistance than none. They might hold on a week, two weeks, three weeks longer than the most susceptible cultivars. So we decided that was the point where we were going to start. We were going to start crossing some of those together and see uh, if we could develop anything with superior resistance. And as early as 2010, uh, we had great promise. So this is an F2 population of a cross between two of those uh, moderately resistant lines. And most things out in the field were dead, but every once in a while we came across a plant that uh, looked pretty good. Now, in this season, uh, we weren't to a point yet where we had great resistance. Everything died by the end of the season, but uh, you, can, you can clearly see there's, there's a difference there. And uh, when we grew out the parents, uh, individuals did much better than the parents, which indicated to us that we were actually combining genes from these various sources. So uh, we were on the right track. So our general breeding strategy from that point forward was basically to plant large populations into heavy pathogen pressure. In this area, downy mildew comes in, or the downy mildew pathogen, I should say, comes in uh, late July, early August. So that's when we wanted to plant. Um, and we wanted to plant young plants in the field so that when we were doing disease ratings, we didn't have to worry about any complicating effects from natural plant senescence. You know, if a plant was turning necrotic, dying, we knew it was from downy mildew. Uh, we harvested fruit regularly uh, so that we didn't have any fruit load uh, effects compounding uh, resistance. Uh, we piled them by the plant so that we could get you know, a rough plant by plant yield estimate. Uh, we would flag early selections. We had harsh selection intensity. At the beginning of the program, uh, the pathogen really did all the, the work for us. You know, there, wasn't, there weren't many things alive at the end of the season. As we uh, increased the frequency of resistance alleles in our population, we got to the point where everything was surviving to the end of the season. So we uh, continued to select the best of the best. And we, we did uh, all phenotypic selection uh, and found that the downy mildew resistance was highly heritable and that our phenotypic values were very predictive of the breeding value uh, and the performance of the uh, lines in future years. We t took cuttings. Uh, there was simply no time for pollinations in the field before frost, so we would take uh, cuttings from the field and bring them into the greenhouse to advance the generations, uh, which was very easily done with cucumbers. You just slice off a growing tip, stick it in some media, make sure it stays warm and moist, and you can have 90% rooting uh, or even better. And at first we did uh, a pedigree selection approach as is very common in cucumber breeding programs, but then added a recurrent selection approach with some intermating in the greenhouse, which uh, we needed to capture and retain all of the resistance alleles that we were bringing in together um, because there was just too many to capture with moderate sized populations uh, in the field. So by 2012, we had some lines that we were ready to trial. Uh, up top is DMR NY264, which was our uh, top 
uh, breeding line, and below it are the two parents. So uh, 264 stayed green uh, all the way till frost, produced fruit all the way till frost. Uh, you can see here that it was doing better than its parents, which uh, would eventually die uh, in the course of the season. And all this compared with one of our susceptible checks, uh, Piccolino, which uh, died almost right out of the gate. And this is very uh, typical of a lot of cultivars that growers were growing. You just whisper the words downy mildew and they you know, <laughs> wilt. Um, here is 264 again with uh, two cultivars that were identified in um, the late 2000s. So, uh, so some folks at North Carolina did some trials to figure out uh, were, was there any resistance in cultivars. They included over 80 cultivars that uh, growers were commonly using at the time or were historically important. And these two uh, made it to the top of the list. So uh, this was the most resistant single year multi-state cultivar and this was the most resistant multi-year multi-state cultivar. So uh, as you can see, they're not very good. Uh, to, to really highlight that uh, there were no uh, options for growers uh, at this time. So, and I should say in the trial, these were not reported to be very good either. They were just the best of the worst. Um, you know, they, they acknowledge that, yeah, these aren't very good, but, you know, they might survive a week longer. We also included, uh, they did another study uh, looking at all the USDA accessions, and there was one that stood out, uh, this PI197088, that we also included in our trial, and it it held up pretty well. Uh, it had very similar levels of resistance to some of our top lines, um, but resistance is about the only thing you can say for it. Uh, it's a wild accession that was collected in India. Um, I, as far as I know, nobody really eats it or would want to. It's this very uh, netted, hollow, bitter fruit that is on a plant that has a lot of sticky sap and is highly male and is late to flower. So. Um, it has a, a lot of really negative uh, agronomic and horticultural characteristics that uh, we didn't have to deal with by not using it uh, right out of the gate. <laughs> so one thing we were really interested in is uh, do we have high enough level of resistance to uh, reduce or even avoid the use of fungicides because this was a huge deal for growers. Um, I, I have a case example here. Michigan grows uh, 30,000 acres of cucumber. They were spending, uh, growers collectively were spending $6.4 million a year on fungicide on cucurbits. Most of that was for uh, fungicides for downy mildew on cucumber. And uh, this was costing growers up to $600 an acre, which was uh, completely eliminating the profitability for a lot of them. And they really had no choice on the fungicides they used. Uh, because downy mildew uh, had overcome so many fungicides, they were forced to use the latest and greatest, most expensive. And because it uh, reproduces so quickly and is so virulent, they were spraying on a weekly basis and spraying even before the pathogen uh, came into the area because once you see it, you know, it's game over. And even with uh, fungicides, you know, they were gaining uh, or they are, I should say, you know, uh, fungicides are still important. They gain some time, and often it is enough time to, to get a harvest, but uh, growers really want uh, something, resistance that they can add to their fungicide programs. So what we did was we did a split plot trial where we had four uh, cultigens. We had two cultivars, uh, a slicer and a pickler that are very common in production. Uh, and then we had two of our breeding lines, including 264, which is our, was our top line. In one of the plots, we had a no treatment uh, trial. We didn't spray fungicide at all. And the other one, we used what is a standard uh, grower application of fungicides. So we, we sprayed weekly, alternated between two of the most effective fungicides at the time. And what we found, not surprisingly, was uh, this is a measure of uh, area under disease progress curve, uh, a measure of uh, total amount of disease that the plants have. The higher numbers are worse, you want a, a lower number. Uh, without uh, any sort of treatment, uh, Dasher 2 and Eureka uh, died pretty quickly. 
um, they accumulated a lot of disease very quickly. Um, and we, we still saw some effect of using fungicide with our lines, but this top line uh, was statistically not different between the uh, fungicide and no fungicide applications, which indicated to us that uh, growers could use this line without, in, in areas of moderate pressure, uh, could use this line without fungicide or with uh, reduced fungicide applications. So uh, this was a, a really significant finding for us. So we released uh, this line and it, it was immediately picked up by a small seed company in the south where it really gained traction because of the heavy disease pressure there and uh, the lack of any time at all to grow cucumbers before the disease moves into the area. Uh, but it still had some, some flaws that we needed to work on. Uh, we wanted to improve earliness. We were about 10 to 15, 264 is about 10 to 15 days later than uh, commercial cultivars, which uh, with cucumbers, when you're talking about a crop that uh, usually starts producing fruit in about uh, 55 days, that's, that's pretty significant. Uh, we wanted to improve yield. It's always a goal. Uh, reduce the male flowering. Um, it, it, it had a little bit skewed ratio that we wanted to change and improve the fruit size. So 264 really was a uh, slicer in a pickler's body. Um, it was a small <laughs> four to six inch fruit, uh, but had uh, the skin of a slicer. So we wanted to change that. So we started crossing, uh, you know, went, went back to crossing uh, 264 with some elite lines and cultivars using the same approach that uh, I described earlier. So <clears throat> as of last year, we had some new lines that uh, we again trialed. And this is courtesy of uh, Lauren, who uh, I worked with last year to set up uh, the trial. And she took all this data after I had left. Um, and our most promising line, 401, did extremely well in the field. Here's a picture of it uh, that uh, we took uh, for a publication. Uh, we now have an 8 to 10 inch fruit as opposed to 5 to 6. Uh, it has a similar disease resistance in this first column as 264 and much better than everything else we compared it to. And I should point out that um, this SV line, Darlington and Centella, are cultivars that have been released by uh, seed companies with purported downy mildew tolerance or um, resistance. So we wanted to compare our material with what was considered the best on the market at the time. And uh, there was really no comparison uh, for the resistance. The uh, fruit under disease pressure was much higher than uh, everything else. And like I said, it was bigger fruit, uh, not only more, but bigger. And days to harvest was right where we wanted it to be, right in line with the other commercial cultivars. So, um, and here you can see um, the plants growing out in the field. Uh, our two lines here, the Mark Moore 97, which kind of represents this B group here, and then straight A, which is another very susceptible variety, uh, was completely dead at the time all these pictures were taken. So um, we're, we released uh, 401 uh, and uh, look forward to it being uh, trialed by seed companies as a line uh, to be sold by itself or in a hybrid. Uh, and one question I get a lot is, how durable do you think the resistance is? And that's a good question. It's a hard question to answer. Um, there's some anxiety about any new uh, line that is produced because uh, this, this is a really nasty pathogen in terms of its ability to, to mutate and overcome uh, plant host resistance and, and uh, develop resistance to fungicides. So here's just a couple uh, articles that have been uh, released uh, since this new strain came on board uh, showing new avenues for uh, Pseudopernospora cubensis, the, the pathogen, to uh, mutate change and uh, cause infection. So. Uh, Mostly the pathogen is spread via asexual zoospores, but uh, a new mating type has been found in the US, which could open the door for sexual reproduction and recombination that comes with that. Uh, there's different populations of the pathogen. Uh, there's a lot of genetic variability out there, uh, which if it starts recombining could uh, be very problematic. 
We've now found evidence of seed transmission. So this is extremely important because before, you know, we could predict where it was going to be based on wind currents. Now it just depends on where seed is moving potentially. Um, and also there's been some new hosts discovered uh, that might actually allow the pathogen to overwinter. So uh, it's a problem that we still have to work on. There's still a lot of unknowns, but one of the great things about the line that we've developed or the lines that we've developed is that they're really a combination of resistance genes from different sources. Uh, we don't know exactly how many. We know it's more than can be easily determined by uh, segregation ratios and in um, family populations, but we don't know how many it is. But it's my hope that it's enough that uh, if we keep working on this, we can stay ahead of the pathogen. So the next steps, obviously, are to continue trialing these lines in numerous locations. Um, uh, development of more commercial cultivars with uh, Cornell material in it. Uh, we need to incorporate resistance into other market types. So the, the pickling sector is actually larger than the slicing cucumber sector in the U.S. And um, uh, we, they are also desperate for some downy mildew resistant material. And, and I know that's one thing that Lauren is working on um, that you might hear about in the future. We need to continue to improve resistance um, maybe by identifying new sources of resistance, um, such as 197088. Could we use that? Does it have different resistance genes that could be combined with the Cornell resistance genes um, to, to really produce almost immunity? And then, uh, depending on uh, how many genes are involved, you know, the development of markers in either a marker assisted selection or even a genomic selection approach could help us more easily move these genes into new material. So uh, that was cucumbers. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about the work we've done to map the powdery mildew resistance uh, gene, PM0 and cucurbita. And cucurbita is the genus of squash and pumpkins. First, a look at the disease, powdery mildew. Uh, so powdery mildew uh, is a disease that can occur on uh, a lot of very taxonomically diverse plant species. Uh, the disease is caused by a number of different pathogens, all from the same fungal family. So we're dealing with a fungal disease instead of an oomycete. And th this is pretty common symptoms. You know, it'll range depending on the pathogen and the host, but oftentimes you'll see these white fuzzy spots on leaves. Uh, powdery mildew is a foliar pathogen. And those fuzzy spots are the signs of the pathogen. They're the colonies of uh, canidiophores, which are the reproductive structures. Eventually, uh, these colonies will coalesce so that you have a, a fuzzy mat on the upper leaf surface and potentially the lower leaf surface. And uh, in the course of infection, you can often get chlorotic areas at the point of or nearby the colonies, um, which is a sign of the, the pathogen uh, using the plant's resources. So it's um, the most prevalent disease on squash and pumpkins, like the downy mildew pathogen, it's dispersed aerially, so it's pretty much everywhere that squash and pumpkins are grown. Uh, unlike downy mildew, it typically results in slow plant death, um, but can definitely reduce uh, fruit quantity, quality, and storability. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, the number one disease that squash and pumpkin growers are asking about and talking about. So uh, powdery mildew can occur on uh, all of the cultivated uh, species uh, that we use. And I just wanted to introduce them because you'll hear me talking about these different species uh, a little bit later on. So uh, one of the species that uh, is common in the US is cucurbita pipo. And that includes your jack-o'-lantern pumpkins, your spaghetti squash, acorn squash, uh, zucchinis, summer squash. Uh, then there's cucurbita moshata, which includes your butternuts, uh, sometimes your cheese type pumpkins, and also uh, processing type pumpkins. So uh, there's the Dickinson variety, among others, that uh, are typically used to make canned pumpkin pie filling. Um, and then there's uh, cucurbita maxima, uh, which includes the buttercup types. <laughs> 
and your giant award-winning pumpkins uh, <laughs> modeled by Chris and Kyle right here. You're going for a number that beats that this year, right? And uh, once again, most squash and pumpkins are produced in eastern states. About 80% of the production is east of the Mississippi River and a production value of about $335 million. So as you can imagine, uh, this is such an important disease in squash and pumpkins that breeders and geneticists have been looking for a long time for sources of resistance. Uh, unfortunately, there's no known resistance, native resistance in cucurbita pipo. Back in the early 1970s, some uh, researchers grew out the whole USDA collection of all three of these species and found nothing that even approached acceptable resistance in cucurbita pipo. They found some moderate resistance in both uh, cucurbita moshata and maxima, but it wasn't really robust. It's, it wasn't what uh, would even approach what was desired by the industry and marketplace. However, there <coughs> is known to be powdery mildew resistance in several wild cucurbita species. And uh, here are some of the cucurbita species shown here. And with, this is a, a crossing polygon showing what things are sparingly compatible. Uh, a line doesn't mean it's readily compatible, but it means that if you work hard enough at it and long enough, you can often get a few seeds from the cross. So one of these species, Cucurbita okeechobeeensis here, uh, is resistant and uh, was collected in Mexico uh, a long time ago and sent to Cornell. Uh, with the hope that it could be crossed with uh, Moshada and Pipo to, to bring resistance in. And that was ultimately very successful. Uh, after a lot of effort, uh, resistance was transferred from this wild gourd-like plant to Cucurbita Moshada and then eventually into Cucurbita Pipo through a Moshada bridge. So it needed a little help there, but, but they made it. And uh, it wasn't complete resistance that was transferred because we've never seen any powdery mildew on this plant in the field. It's completely resistant. In Cucurbita moshata and Pipo, uh, we don't see that. And the reason for that is that a single gene was transferred. Uh, we, we now know that this has many genes that contribute, but a very important gene was transferred, PM0, and that gene confers enough resistance that uh, growers often need reduced, uh, growers use reduced fungicide applications and in a moderate year of pathogen pressure don't need any at all. So it's, it's adequate to get them to the end of the season. And uh, the single gene was confirmed back in the 1970s using segregating populations. So from there, uh, at Cornell, this gene was transferred into a lot of different materials. It was transferred into to both subspecies of Cucurbita pipo, uh, into pumpkin, uh, and these varieties are all names uh, of varieties developed at Cornell, uh, into zucchini, including uh, Romulus here, which has been uh, the source of resistance for uh, a lot of the things we've done historically in, in the breeding program. Uh, it was transferred into the other subspecies of cucurbita pipo, into straight neck squash and acorn and delicata. It, it was moved into different butternuts in cucurbita moshata, a large butternut and a smaller butternut, a bugle, which is uh, you can find in a number of seed catalogs. And one interesting cultivar that lost resistance, it was transferred into uh, a cucurbita pipo, uh, cocozelli, which is, is kind of like a zucchini, but later uh, we found lost the resistance, so that'll be important in just a minute. So from, from here, uh, these were disseminated to seed companies that use these as sources of the PM0 gene, uh, use these or their progenitors uh, as we shared, uh, as the Cornell program shared along the way and uh, continue to be extremely important. Pretty much every uh, variety that is powdery mildew resistant today uh, has its roots in these efforts uh, and has the PM0 gene. Um, it's an incredibly widely used gene, but a problem to date is that there are no markers for it. 
Uh, and one of the reasons for that is a lot of the squash and, breeding, uh, squash and pumpkin breeding efforts are done by small to medium sized companies that just don't have the resources for mapping and market development. Uh, and actually, we have, uh, many of you might know that we host the Vegetable Breeding Institute field days every year where seed company representatives will come in and see the resources that uh, the Cornell breeding programs have developed and, and kind of pitch their ideas on what they want to see in the future. And one of my favorite things to ask them every year was, if you could pick one thing for a public research institution to develop that would have utility for your breeding program, what would it be? And without fail, every year uh, for squash, the two answers were markers for powdery mildew resistance and markers for virus resistance. So it was, it was a huge need uh, that we wanted to, to solve right away. So we got to thinking, what can we, um, how can, how can we, we map this gene uh, quickly without developing new populations, without um, waiting additional seasons, and using uh, the germplasm that we already have available? We have uh, what we termed a shared trait integration panel. They were things that were very diverse in very different species, uh, subspecies, and market classes, but they all had one thing in common, and that was a single gene from a wild species. So what we decided to do was um, we sequenced uh, Cucurbita uh, Okeechobeeensis subspecies Martinesii, the original source of the PM0 gene, uh, using genotyping by sequencing. And um, we also uh, got together a bunch of heirloom varieties in Cucurbita pipo and one in um, Cucurbita moshata, things that were around before the integration event took, plat took place, uh, things that had no chance of having any of the wild species in them. And uh, we genotyped these also with GBS. And then we filtered all of the markers uh, so that we only kept the set that had one allele for Martinesii and one allele for all of the heirlooms uh, together. And then we sequenced quite a large number of heirlooms. Um, and uh, we anchored all of these markers using uh, an F2 population that was being grown at the time the study was done at Rupp Seeds. So we, we partnered with them on this project, uh, and they, they shared some of their data. This was an interspecific population, so it was really great for uh, developing lots of markers. From there, uh, we genotyped uh, the Cornell shared integration, integration panel that I was uh, referring to e earlier. Uh, all of these uh, inbred lines, inbred cultivars, that were diverse but shared something in common. And we looked across the genome. Uh, each one of these bars represents a chromosome from 1 to 20. And uh, we looked at whether they had the heirloom allele or whether they had the Martinesii or Okeechobeeensis allele. So gray is heirloom and blue is um, Martinesii. And you can see uh, the chunk of Cucurita Martinesia just lights right up, right on linkage group 10. So we were pretty confident uh, that we had found something there. When we zoomed in on the region, so this is a zoomed in uh, pictograph uh, on linkage group 10. Once again, we have uh, the wild species up top. We found that uh, there was some recombination around the area, uh, not surprisingly. You remember me talking about the line that had resistance that lost it. Uh, it was right here. It still had part of the Martinesii integration. It just didn't have the resistance. And all of these up here had resistance. So we were able to use that to identify a relatively small 500 kilobase region uh, that we were pretty confident had the resistance gene. It had to be somewhere in here, because these had it. And it couldn't be here, because this one uh, didn't have the resistance. So uh, once we had this interval, we uh, followed up with uh, a pretty small GWAS study. But um, there's only so many cultivars that are out there right now, You know, since uh, the first cultivars started appearing in the late 1990s. 
Um, but we found about 81 cucurbit pe pepo cultivars, many with the PM0 resistance uh, in both subspecies and all morphotypes. So uh, here you have uh, the Texana subspecies, here is the pepo subspecies, uh, and we had pumpkins, uh, zucchini, acorns, delicata, uh, anything that we could find, any market type that had the resistance gene and uh, where we had heirlooms that lacked it. We uh, grew them all out in the field in uh, replicated plots and we used petiole ratings as our phenotype. And one thing we've learned over many years is that petiole ratings are the easiest way to determine if something is carrying the PM0 gene. Um, leaf, leaves can vary a little bit, but almost invariably uh, something that is homozygous for the resistance allele will not have any colonies on its petiole. Something that is homozygous for the susceptibility allele will be just covered. And usually something that's heterozygous will have colonies at its base and taper off and the tips will be clean. And then we added two other classes just to um, be able to represent some sort of intermediate phenotypes that we saw in the field. What we found uh, was uh, pretty clear. Uh, on linkage group 10, <laughs> uh, right over the interval, we had our peak. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with these types of plots, this is called a Manhattan plot, where the linkage groups are uh, on the bottom. And the negative log of the p value, which represents the significance of the allele relating to the trait or the phenotype. Um, and so we had a very significant uh, hit right at the interval um, where, where we assumed the locus was at. As one more confirmation, um, we teamed up with Rupp again, who uh, did a simple binary rating on their F2 population. This was the same F2 that we used to anchor our SNPs. And um, we took four uh, markers. These uh, two inside the interval and these two flanking the interval to see if uh, they used a different accession of Okeechobeeensis if, if the PM0 gene was in that one as well. And what we see is uh, very much what we expected. Uh, we see an additive or incompletely dominant gene action here uh, where the plants, the group of plants that had uh, were homozygous for the susceptibility alleles had higher disease ratings. The ones that uh, where homozygous for the resistance allele had significant, statistically significant lower ratings. And as we moved outside of that interval, uh, the difference in PM scores uh, was reduced. So uh, we did some fine mapping uh, and narrowed that 500 KB region to about uh, a little less than 80 K, uh, KB. And we found a number of interesting candidate genes. So uh, I've highlighted four of them here. Uh, we found a predicted peroxidase, which uh, is known to uh, contribute to powdery mildew resistance in uh, barley. Uh, there's the salicylic acid binding protein, uh, which contributes to powdery mildew resistance in Arabidopsis. Uh, this one I think is particularly interesting. This is a, uh, an NBS LRR that uh, is a powdery mildew resistance protein in Arabidopsis. And then uh, zinc finger, there's a zinc finger protein here, um, and those are involved in a lot of biotrophic pathogen resistances. So it could be any number of these. Uh, this is as far as we are at to date. Uh, it presents a lot of interesting questions moving forward for someone to follow up on. Uh, and we definitely don't rule out the possibility that's a number of these genes acting in tandem. Um, it could be uh, multiple of these or, um, you know, in the case of the R gene, it's a very big R gene. Maybe it's actually a raft of R genes uh, connected to each other. And so the last thing we did, um, and this credit goes to Kyle, uh, was to take some of our markers and, and or take some of the, the SNPs and develop markers into them. Uh, we release the sequence information so that those can be adapted to any platform that the breeders want and uh, ran some caps here where we had perfect segregation between uh, the phenotype and the marker. So the next steps, um, 
evaluate candidates to identify the causal gene. Uh, I think that'll be a very uh, interesting exercise. Uh, we need to continue to improve powdered mildew resistance in commercial cultivars. This isn't directly related to what I was talking about, but it's very important. Uh, as I said, the PM0 gene doesn't confer immunity into, uh, into the tolerant um, genotypes. Uh, and there has been more reports in recent years that the resistance isn't holding up as well as it had in the past. And that's not at all surprising. We're talking about a single gene resistance. Eventually, that's going to break down. So we need to be on top of uh, finding other sources of resistance, um, using recurrent selection approaches to combine these small effect alleles that might be natively in cucurbita pipo or especially cucurbita moshata. Uh, we could also revisit some of these wild species to pick up uh, the genes that were left behind in the beginning. And we have a lot more tools and technologies now to do that than they had in the 1970s. So uh, really briefly, I'm going to uh, talk about um, a collaborative effort with the USDA on uh, doing some genetic characterization of uh, what we term the USDA Pisum Diversity Collection. And this collection really has its roots in a core collection uh, developed in the early 1990s that was assembled to maximize geographical and morphological diversity within the collection. Uh, and accessions were collected all around the world, and this map shows uh, the 238 accessions of the UPDC, as we call it, uh, that were collected. In addition, uh, there's almost 200 accessions that were uh, developed by breeding programs or donated by institutions but have unknown collection origins. And um, one, thing, one thing in particular to note is that this collection includes uh, breeding material from uh, the USDA and Washington State breeding programs and uh, field peas and uh, snap peas uh, developed by uh, Jim Myers and his predecessors at Oregon State. So, um, oh, I should I should say that this collection uh, is used widely by pea breeders to find uh, new traits. So uh, the collection's been grown out. The core collection and its derivatives, including the UPDC, have been grown out in various permutations. Uh, many times by uh, breeders looking for new traits. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, traits that have been, uh, phenotypes that have been recorded and are publicly available. One big thing that was missing was any sort of high density molecular data. Um, and this was needed to be able to map those traits. A lot of the traits uh, that are important in P are single gene traits that would be relatively simple to map with enough markers and enough individuals. Um, the phenotype data is already there. And another thing we wanted to do was be able to um, get a genetic snapshot uh, of what the collection looked like. Uh, oftentimes, uh, morpho uh, the phenotypes could look similar, but they could be very genetically unrelated. So this would help us to, to tease out where uh, diversity is for breeding programs. So one of the first things we did was look at the structure of the collection. And um, here we have a principal components uh, diagram showing uh, each one of these dots represents an accession uh, that was genotyped. Uh, here are the Oregon State snap peas, snap and snow peas. Here are the Washington State field peas. And then these other colors um, were used based on previous studies that included these materials. So this uh, study, or this color here, yellow, represents uh, the cultivated type P, uh, Pisum sativum subspecies sativum. Here are, uh, in blue, are the two recognized subspecies of Pisum sativum, Elatius and Abyssinicum. And what is perhaps the most interesting is this area of green here. So these peas here come from Central Asia. And, and really, all of these do, too. Um, these were just the ones that were included in, in previous studies. Uh, and these are not recognized as a separate uh, subspecies. Uh, many people have noticed that peas from Central Asia seem to be different than cultivated peas. 
but no one has really looked too much into it. So one of the things we were interested in doing with the genetic data is trying to see if we could uncover anything about this, this very different group of peas. And it should be said that um, these peas are often found in mountainous regions in Central Asia. So if you think of the mountainous areas in Iran and Afghanistan, India, and Nepal, um, they tend to be more cold tolerant. They have different, uh, uh, they tend to be low growing, basal branching. So there's a lot of um, phenotypic differences as well. One of the questions we had, and which um, hasn't really been addressed, is um, is it possible that, that these uh, accessions had some ancient or maybe more recent uh, introgression from Pisum fulvum, which is the only other sister species of Pisum sativum? So we went to the USDA collection and, and genotyped uh, with GBS some Pisum fulvums to see if they clustered nearby these Central Asian peas. And those are included at red at the top, and we found out that they don't. Uh, and one of the reasons we thought they might was because there are some phenotypic similarities. So uh, there still is work that needs to be done to figure out where do these peas come from. And um, these, these peas have a lot of genetic diversity. We looked at uh, how much diversity they have to offer to breeding programs. And so on, on the left, we have uh, each group, Pisum fulvum, the subspecies Elatius, the cultivated types, the sativum, and um, the Central Asian peas. And we looked at how many SNPs they have that are unique to each of those groups versus these groups here. So we found, uh, and, and we corrected for different um, population sizes within each, each of these groups. We found that the Central Asian peas had over 6,000 SNPs, uh, and this is uh, out of uh, six, around 68,000 SNPs total that were different than anything else. And when we compared that to the breeding program peas, Washington State and Oregon State, we found that they actually had more unique alleles than even the Pisum fulvum. And one very important key here is that these Central Asian peas have not really been used in breeding efforts, uh, as far as I know, anywhere but they are fully compatible with cultivated sativums, whereas Pisum fulvum is a different species, and there's a lot of crossing barriers that exist there to bring in that diversity. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we've developed the first slicing cucumber with high resistance to a new strain of downy mildew. We have uh, resistance genes in uh, very diverse, moderately resistant, uh, material that we know can be combined to provide high levels of resistance. With resistance, we can reduce or eliminate the need for uh, fungicides. We found that this shared trait integration panel mapping approach is very effective, and we think it can be used a lot in vegetable crops where this whole model of bringing in a single gene from wild species is very common. There's been a lot of disease resistance genes that have been introduced um, from a single wild species, and we think this approach uh, could really illuminate those in, in short order. We now have markers for PM0, which is the most widely used gene in squash and pumpkin breeding, and which a lot of uh, seed companies have already started implementing into their uh, breeding pipelines. We have a high density SNP data set that's now available for genetic characterization and hopefully trait mapping uh, in a very diverse collection of P. And uh, we're particularly interested in um, the application of this data to use this group of peas from Central Asia for uh, bringing in additional diversity to, to breeding programs. So uh, there's lots of people to acknowledge for all of these different projects. I want to uh, say special thanks to my graduate committee, uh, Michael and Mike Gore and Susan and Chris Smart. Um, they've been tremendously supportive uh, throughout uh, the time I've been here and have, uh, you know, I've been able to bounce a lot of ideas off of them. And uh, special thanks to uh, all the current and former members of the Missouri Lab Group. Um, you know, as we were figuring things out, 
Uh, we really help each other uh, with various uh, skills and expertise. Uh, co these are a list of co-authors uh, who have been very instrumental in, in all of these different studies um, in cucumber, squash, and pea. Uh, the Cornell Farm and uh, Greenhouse uh, research teams uh, can't get enough thanks for everything they do to keep things going throughout the year and the season. Uh, Mary Kreidinger at the Vegetable Breeding Institute uh, has been very helpful all the time, uh, has answered a lot of questions over the years. Um, when we first got started in genotyping, Sharon Mitchell and Charlotte uh, Charia spent a lot of time helping us get going. Uh, in those directions. Uh, we had some collaborators at other institutions as well, uh, Yishun and John Murphy and Rupp Seeds, uh, that donated seeds or uh, uh, resources uh, along the way. And also, um, thanks in large part to all of the funding that allowed us to be able to do all of these things. So with that, I'll take questions. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.